The St. Lawrence, a mighty Atlantic river, long renowned for the richness and abundance of its resources. Discovered by Basque, Breton, and Norman fishermen long before the arrival of Jacques Cartier in 1534, its history is based on fishing, and the coastal and insular life of today still beats to the rhythm of the tides and the seasons. The locals call it the sea, and it is said that its inhabitants have salt water in their veins. Today's fishermen are not merely a vestige of acquired knowledge. They are the history and origin of a people, and the St. Lawrence, a sea that welcomed the builders of the new world. One of the largest rivers in the world, the St. Lawrence has fed Quebec and the Maritimes for generations. But today, the future of fisheries and its traditions remain uncertain. Fishing defined the identity of the sailors and fishermen of this country. For a long time, the development of coastal communities has been mainly based on the exploitation of stocks of a single species of fish, cod, once known as the white gold of the seas. Everyone on the Gaspé Peninsula, on the Magdalen Islands, all over New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, was born with cod in their blood. Ask anyone who fishes nowadays, for any kind of fish, how they got started in fishing, it'll be cod. It was our livelihood. We all fish for cod. It's in our blood. 1978 or 80, up to the 90s, there was lots of cod. We could land 20 to 25,000 pounds every day if we wanted. Then in 1990, the new factory trawlers came out. Instead of landing 25,000 pounds of fish, we could process 50,000 pounds a day. So uh, uh, we really took a licking. There was overfishing, there was climate change, restrictions on the seal hunt, and, and before we knew it, the cod was gone. The overfishing left no chance for the resource. In 1992, with the stocks collapsing, the Canadian government decided to intervene. I've decided that effective at midnight tonight, there will be a moratorium in harvesting of northern cod until the spring of 1994. Six generations down the line passed out, and he's done nothing but S-H-I-T to his... <laughs> from the goddamn water. Well, who took it? You, you, you and your goddamn people! The tension began to mount. Fishermen blamed government scientists for overvaluing the resource. A moratorium put tens of thousands of fishery workers on the streets. The following year, the moratorium was extended to the entire Gulf of St. Lawrence. Newfoundland had 30,000 unemployed fishermen and fish workers. And here there were, I don't know how many thousands, boom, sitting on their asses. I sat on my porch, bawling my eyes out for two years. 60 deep sea fishermen in 1992, now there's 12. For 23 years, we've been twiddling our thumbs. I tell you, it's hard. Hard for everyone. Stocks have never recovered, and Atlantic cod are now on the list of endangered species. In the Magdalen Islands, fishing is the foundation of the community. Again, the effects of the moratorium are still present. Denis Longuepé is a lobsterman. Gislain Cyr is a traditional fisherman. And Denis Eloquin now makes a living catching crab. There are not many fishermen left in the Magdalen Islands who are still fishing fish. 
It is now the lobster fishing industry and tourism that drive the economy. Gislain Cyr keeps the faith. From the moment I could get into a pair of boots, I was fishing. We start out fishing off the dock, then horse around in the harbor in a skiff, catching mackerel, and fish for lobster in the summer, illegally. <laughs> we ate what we caught. As a kid, I'd trip over my feet in the backyard, but I was steady as a rock at sea. They're the same. I'm from the next generation. Fishermen here recognize their mistakes of the past. At that time, there was little concern about the effects of overfishing a resource that was thought to be almost inexhaustible. Herring, an abundant species that breeds here in the spring, has been overfished. It now serves, among other things, as bait for lobster fishing, which people here call la boite. Bringing in great gobs of fish wasn't worth it in the long run. We know that today. Today, we don't have to have an enormous catch like before. Before, you had to get every fish in the sea and come in with your boat flushed off to make a living. It's not like that now. Now you can catch a bit of fish that pays a lot more per pound, and with well-structured quotas, you can fish longer and earn more money. What used to happen when there was an overall quota, we all went crazy. Everyone wanted to fish the fastest, catch the most, get the fish to the factory, and if you lose some, who cares? Just fill up the boat again. And in the end, as you said, we destroyed the herring stocks through our actions. Because the price was so low, we had to fill her up to the gunnels to make any money at all. It's different nowadays. Prices have shot up. We used to get six cents a pound for herring. Today, it can go as high as 70 cents. So you don't need to fish as much. 20 years ago, you'd go fishing, you'd make mistakes, and it cost nothing. Not today. Nowadays, you need fuel, bait, and a crew. It costs 20,000 just to untire. Nobody can afford to lose 20,000, and then another 20,000, and so on and so on. Speaking of overfishing, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, the DFO, they were the ones who subsidized factory trawlers to scoop up massive amounts of fish of any kind. Mistakes were made for sure, but there were also a lot more fishermen back then. There used to be 25, 30 or 40 trawlers on the Magdalene Islands. These days there are five or six. No one is more cautious these days than fishermen. We've made mistakes, but today fishermen know that the fish they catch is their livelihood, and their survival depends on its survival. Places like the Maggies and all the small coastal communities in eastern Canada, we will only survive if we live off what we harvest from the sea. The lessons of the past have inspired a new way of thinking among fishermen. Today, the lobster fishing industry has mobilized and initiated effective conservation measures to protect the resource. Every spring, the passion and effervescence returns to the docks. The 325 vessels carrying about 850 fishermen and their assistants are on the verge of going to sea, as is the long-held tradition. Claude Nadeau has fished all his life, like his father and his grandfather. Today, he passes the torch to his son, Martin, who begins his first year as captain. This is flounder. We use it as lobster bait. This is mackerel. And since the pots will be in the water for two days, we put in a lot. So it'll last the two days in the water. I started with my dad, and this year, it's my first year as captain. We catch some of the flounder in the Magdalene Islands, but not a lot of it. And it's expensive. It's around $200 a crate. We go through about one full crate a day. 
We don't catch much mackerel nowadays. There isn't much in the Maggie's. They don't come near the shore, so we have to buy it. Japanese companies sell it. It's from Japan or Newfoundland. They sell the mackerel for a dollar five a pound. It's expensive. In my father's day, we caught a lot of herring, but in the fall, we'd catch mackerel. We'd freeze it in the fall to use in the spring. But there's none left. It's just not there. If you want to catch mackerel, you have to take your boat as far as Chetikin, places like that in the Gaspé. There's none along the shore around here. It's a big expense going that far. In my father's day, the month before lobster season was herring season. We'd catch herring, then switch over to lobster. After that wrapped up, we'd swing into halibut for a good part of the summer. Then mackerel, and back to herring. There was a lot of mackerel and herring. You'd go out in the morning and land 10,000 pounds of mackerel, just like that. Halibut now, it's not even one day a year. It's maybe 10 hours a year. Today, with the price of lobster, it's not easy. With all the operating costs going through the roof, fuel, bait, the lobster isn't priced accordingly. Mackerel, in abundance here a few years ago, is now imported from Japan and costs close to 250 per kilo. With all the modern equipment, it's not hard to be better than we are. Because I've gone fishing with just a compass and the little black and white depth sander and using landmarks. The church, houses, and... <laughs> the future of the island fishery now relies on one main species, the lobster. The big day. The weather is good and the fishermen patiently wait for the flare that launches the lobster fishing season. The flare is launched. The lobster fishermen finally return to sea after a 43 week wait. The lobster fishing season now lasts only nine weeks. In order to conserve the resource, the 325 fishing boats have agreed to reduce the number of traps per vessel to 273. This is my first year as captain. I'm letting my dad skipper for the first day. For the last couple of years, he mostly skippers. So I'll stay on deck today to manipulate the heavy traps. Lobsters change area according to particular environmental variables, such as water temperature, that dictate the movement of the species. Okay, Martin. Every fisherman has his own tricks of the trade. But at the beginning of the season, it is a question of finding where the greatest concentration of lobsters are. We've had the computer for the last 10 years. So every year you note areas that are better than others, but it changes. You can fish in one area where there were thousands one year, and the next, not a one. Commercial fishing is in decline all over the planet. It is estimated that 90% of large fish have disappeared from the oceans in recent decades through unsustainable fishing practices. The St. Lawrence River is no exception. After the bottom fell out of the ground fish stocks in the 90s, the numbers of small pelagic fish such as herring and mackerel shot up, possibly because of fewer predators or especially favorable environmental conditions. But then other predators went after them. Seals, whales and seabirds too. And fishermen went after them as well. They wanted the herring and mackerel as bait to catch other kinds of fish whose price was rising like lobster or crab. The significant decrease in large fish has allowed some species of small fish to proliferate. But fishermen quickly targeted these small fish 
which they now use as bait. You get more money if you sell small fish as bait than if you sell it for human consumption. There's something wrong there. I have trouble, even though I'm a fisherman and I respect people who fish, with the idea of destroying one species to fish for another species. When we catch mackerel, we should make fillets, sell it for as much as we can get, and use what's left over as bait for other fish. Some fishermen have begun using the remains of factory processed fish as bait, which allows significant savings to those willing to change from more traditional methods. But attitudes are sometimes more difficult to change. Alternative bait would be a solution. It's not that there isn't any. It's there, but the fishermen don't want it. Right. Some people think they have to put in a fresh flounder every day, even if yesterday's is still good. Lobsters are scavengers, so are crabs. They'll go into the pots. It's not true they won't go in. We see it. Some people put... You can put nothing in the lobster pot and the lobster will go in. Catching fish we could be eating to go and fish for other fish is a societal choice. At one time, the fish we ate were larger, and the fish we used as bait were fish people didn't want to eat. Now that we're eating smaller and smaller fish, we've created a sort of competition between bait fish and fish for human consumption. Fishermen are still hoping for a return to commercial cod fishing. But the three different Atlantic stocks are at very different stages in terms of recovery. The news is quite encouraging for the cod population off Newfoundland. Against all expectations, scientists observed a return of cod in the mid-2000s. But in 2010, the unthinkable happened. The population exploded from 60,000 to 300,000 tons. We have three different situations. Northern cod, which is on the east coast of Newfoundland and the coast of Labrador. The mortality rate is not a problem. And for the last seven years, especially the last three, we've seen an increase in cod stocks. When you hear about cod recovering, it's mostly in that area. Numbers are high, so we can afford to be hopeful about that. As for the cod in the north of the Gulf, the population is relatively stable, but there is an encouraging sign. Here, around the western tip of Anticosti, back in the day where there was always cod. For 20 years, the population density was low, and now we're beginning to see densities of cod around Anticosti. So while that's a good sign, overall it's not appropriate to increase inshore fishing. For the cod in the south of the Gulf, it's not looking good. We have a very high mortality due to gray seals. The chances of the southern Gulf of St. Lawrence cod recovery are very low. The exponential proliferation of gray seal populations prevents the return of cod. It is estimated that one gray seal eats about two tons of fish per year. Back in the 1980s, 82, 83, there were maybe 12,000 gray seals in the whole area. Today we're talking about 500,000 and more. In the 90s, you'd see one seal, maybe two together. They were never in groups. They were fairly solitary. Well, today you see herds of seals. I'm talking about 100, 200, 300 seals all hunting together. There are places where back in the mid-90s, you could still find young cod, big schools of young cod. And the seals would force them to the surface. Then when they got them up, they'd act just like porpoises or other marine mammals. They swim around in a circle, trapping the cod in the middle and eat them all up. Every last one. A guy was at Miscou last week, after halibut. In a day and a half, he lost 50 to 60 halibut of 50 to 100 pounds, all gone, destroyed. He said one line with 27 halibut on it, nothing left. They stuff themselves on what should be ours, but we fishermen don't have the right to fish for cod or to eat red fish because supposedly they're endangered. Or there's moratoriums. They're not endangered. We've had moratoriums for 25 years, but the seals have the right to gobble up our food. The worst thing would be they start to eat lobster. 
like they do in Nova Scotia. There are people living in outports who'll pay through the nose for that. Could the dramatic increase in gray seal population affect the lobster industry, one of the last pillars of the local economy? When it comes to lobsters that are already caught, we know that where there's a large concentration of seals, seals have been known to get into the pot and take the lobster out. But as for seal predation on lobsters that aren't in pots, that's really anecdotal and I have very little information. For three years, they've been saying we have to manage gray seal numbers. It's got to start right now. When I hear all the stories from Europe and everywhere about people wanting to protect the gray seals, jeez, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know the damage they cause or how smart they are. They're like a pack of wolves. They develop fishing techniques and pass them on. The more there are, the more the techniques get passed on and... I'm telling you, that's a problem because one of these days, they're going to grab a child off the beach. That animal is born evil and dies evil. We have no records to know what effect managing the seal population would have on cod stocks. It's easy to say it would work, but it's hard to find a solution. The gray seal is not the only one stealing from the pantry. Millions of harp seals visit the St. Lawrence every spring. This is the harp seal that they say is facing extinction, but there's around 8.5 million of them. And every year, 1.2 million more are born. Our hunting quota was only 400,000 animals. And in the last three years, we've killed 60,000. That seal eats 15 times more fish than all the fishermen in eastern Canada. In any wildlife reserve, when there's an overpopulation problem, whether it's coyotes or caribou, what do you see? There is a controlled hunt. The Canadian government allows harvesting of harp seals, but the relentless pressure from environmental groups has successfully banned seal products in Europe. Each year, the media war resumes on the pack ice, a war of images, which, according to the fishermen, has lost its scientific bearings. The snow crab fishery is one sector of the industry that is booming. However, this lucrative fishery was shunned in its infancy. Fishermen who agreed to bet on this resource barely made ends meet until the market discovered this crustacean's unique flavor. At first, with snow crabs, some people got crab licenses and didn't keep them. They tried all over here on the North Shore, no luck, so they went back to cod and halibut. And others kept at it. The Japanese got into crab fishing and it flourished. Claude Poirier experienced the evolution of the market, which now has a privileged relationship with Japanese customers who prefer quality rather than quantity. Crab, starting in 1982. The Japanese showed up and that changed. Changed the complexion of that particular fishery. They're scrupulous about their production, whether it's packaging or the, the characteristics of the product itself. I have to say, they have eyes everywhere. When the clients are not here themselves, they have technicians who oversee their production. Even though a climate of confidence has been built up over the years, they're always here to ensure that the product is just the way they want it. There's a 2L. That's a crab destined for the raw market in Japan. It's a live crab, a clean crab. It's pink, so it's, uh, it's perfect. There's no algae. It's ready to go in to be soaked for the Japanese raw market. In the crabs we've seen this morning, the last crabs of the season, how many would qualify for the Japanese market? 
For the raw market, I'd say 1%. 1%. Maybe one or two crabs. Fishing is always precarious. Cod, which was very abundant for many years, herring, uh, mackerel, they've practically disappeared from our fishery. Crab and especially lobster, they're about the only two species that remain stable. For this first day of the season's catch, lobstermen keep their fingers crossed. We've had years where the first days were no good. 50 pounds we'd start off with. It's better these days, a lot better. In years gone by, I'd sometimes catch no more than 50 pounds in the first weeks. It was always better at the end than at the beginning. It was rough. The pressure is on for Martin, who begins his first year as captain. The results of this first day will determine whether the large lobster concentrations are offshore or closer inland. It is a rough start. The traps are virtually empty, and the lobsters that were caught are too small to be kept. The profit generated by the few lobsters caught doesn't even cover the cost of the bait, which in any case has to be replaced. Not much of a catch here. Not much of a catch. Other traps dropped far offshore are just as empty. The morale of the troops is low. A father wishes the best for his son, but is aware that the future is uncertain. Disappointed? Sure am. But you have to live with it. It's bound to improve. A change of strategy. The traps are repositioned closer to the coast. The winter was particularly harsh, and the temperature of the water remains cold during this unusual spring. The lobsters may have decided to look for warmer water near the coast. An unexpected visitor. He wants to rest. Maybe he'll bring us luck. He can stay. A new member of the crew. That time. Sometimes the pot's full and other times there aren't a lot. But this is a good haul. It's the good luck bird. 32, 33, 34. Wow, that's great. 
Good table full. 36. It makes you feel good. There are lots of negatives in fishing these days, but uh, it's still the best job in the world. 39. The status of lobster in the St. Lawrence is good right now. And when I say the St. Lawrence, I mean the Gulf and part of the estuary. The stock is abundant. It's increasing everywhere at this point. One issue with lobster fishing everywhere in the Atlantic in the early to mid-90s was that the minimum catch size was around 76 millimeters. And when you study lobster biology, you find out that the size at which a female can reproduce is larger than that. So, Essentially, what we were fishing were individuals who hadn't had time to reproduce. One of the first things we did was increase the minimum catch size. It was introduced over 8 to 10 years at 1 to 2 millimeters a year in collaboration with the fishermen. You beat the record of your father. Yeah, 39 and seven pots. But he had a lot of good years. He had good years. Never 39, but he did okay. It means the lobster's still there. After a difficult start, the situation improves considerably. The first day's catch is important and gives the fishermen hope for another good season. A scientific fishery program allows certain vessels to fish in specific areas to enable government scientists to assess the status of fish populations. But some are challenging the results of fisheries in this observation network. When you're using the sounder, you can see the fish down there underwater. As far as I'm concerned, there's a large amount of fish in the Gulf. We're seeing a lot more cod because for the last three or four years, from the Baie des Chaleurs up to Matane and the Rimouski, people are catching cod with a rod and reel. We've never seen that before, and we never thought it could happen. Ten years ago, if someone said, in 10 years, you'll be catching cod inshore, impossible. We've never seen such a thing. We've only ever caught cod out at sea. An American study just came out that showed that in 10 years, with the current temperature, lobster will move 43 miles north. There are states in the U.S. where there's no more lobster. And here, there's a lot more everywhere, all the way from Nova Scotia right up to Prince Edward Island. And if it's good for lobster, it might be good for other kinds of fish. Fishermen are the ones who notice the major changes. I've been doing sentinel fishery for 10 years, and I fill the boat every four to five days. Everyone says, hey, there's fish. But the biologist always says, no, that doesn't prove this fish. He's all alone, he's a good fisherman, maybe he got lucky and there's no other boats bothering him. There's something not right about that. I'm always asking DFO, who are you saving the fish for? For the seals or for the fishermen? If it's for the fishermen, give us quotas, small quotas, and we'll go out and fish. The natural mortality after five years is very high. For the remaining cod, they tend to be distributed more in areas of deeper water, areas where there is a lower risk of predation by the gray seal. And that's, uh, hence the observations in the Gaspé. The cod we see in the Gaspé are the last remaining cod from the south of the Gulf, who've moved into the most northerly part of their territory. So they stay in that area, but the population is still quite weak. And as soon as the fish get to be five years old, the natural mortality caused by seals is very high. We had a meeting last winter where we requested, we asked for a cod quota in the south of the Gulf of 1,500 tons. 
300 tons for research and 1,200 tons for the shore communities. Because 1,200 tons is nothing compared to the 35,000 tons eaten by gray seals. And we can't even get 1,000 tons to feed the people who live here? There's a problem. What we demand is to be allowed to continue to fish, to show that there are cod, and to do it better than we used to. But to say we have no right to do anything, and that it can be two years before the government, DFO, reopens the fishery, well, we've missed our chance. When the moratorium came into effect, we were landing up to 80,000 tons here. That's a lot of fish in one year. Each year, for several years, there was 50, 60,000 tons. That's a lot of fish. Then there was zero during the moratorium, and after, we went back to six, 7,000 tons a year. That's not a lot compared to 60,000, but it was too much. We tried that for a few years, six, 7,000, and we needed another moratorium in 2003. Then we tried again, but no, it really was too much. So it took us about 15 years to learn that you can't rebuild the fish stocks while taking six, 7,000 tons a year. So we're down to 1,500 tons. Overall, that's not a lot, but it does maintain commercial fishing, especially along the shores of Newfoundland. And Gaspé fishermen will fish in the area of the north of the Gulf, which takes in 4S, 4R and the 3PN. Fishermen can fish, so they're out on the water. It's a minimum, but we think that this catch is small enough to let the cod stock rebuild slowly. The predictions for the southern Gulf of St. Lawrence are rather pessimistic. Some scientists even suggest that cod could disappear from this part of the Gulf altogether. Redfish, however, are on the rise in the Gulf and are the only real hope in the short term. They're afraid we'll go out and succeed, because then they can't say there's no fish. They don't want to give us quotas because they know there are fish out there, but they don't want to reopen the fishery and we don't know why. The errors of the past perhaps call for greater prudence in the fishing industry. Despite differing views of the current situation, the principles of prevention are influencing the decisions made by the fisheries administrators. But a new threat is now raising fears for fishermen. The old Harry oil field, located off the Magdalen Islands, straddles the boundary between Quebec and Newfoundland. It possibly contains large reserves of natural gas and oil. While the economic potential remains unknown, the environmental risks are very clear. In Ottawa, 90% of the requests they get are for oil wells. They don't want to give up fishing licenses. The alarm bells started going off for us about four or five years ago. We don't know why, but it, I, I think they want to keep the area open. They don't want any more fishermen than there are now. Even if there was lots of fish, I don't think they'll allow any more fishermen. Because they want to drill, and you can't have fishing boats all over the place, otherwise they'll have to pay the fishermen off again. They want to drill at the entrance of the Gulf. All the pelagic fish, the ground fish, everything that moves around in the water passes through that channel. I say, what's the idea of drilling a well right there? It makes no sense. We don't know that much about the currents. As far as fish are concerned, we're the experts. We know better than anyone else, and we say, no, that's not the place. If there's one place in the world where you shouldn't be drilling, that's it. The last day of the lobster fishing season. Nine short weeks to fill the coffers and hopefully live off the spoils for the rest of the year. Martin has had a good season. The family tradition is in good hands. The protective measures put forward by the Fishermen's Association and the scientists seem to be bearing fruit. The different populations of lobster in the St. Lawrence River are doing well, and the area has hope of some stability. A female hatches her eggs under her abdomen. They represent the future of the species and the future of the fishermen. Right.
I quit school at 15. But for uh, five or six winters, I took fishing courses to become a captain, what's called a class four. If my way of making a living dies out, I have nothing to fall back on. I'm all in. That's why I encourage my kids to have more choices than I do. Maybe just stay in school so they'll have some career options. If they want to do it, they will, but at least they'll have something to fall back on. It went great. Couldn't ask for anything better. We have lobsters and the price is right. A good price is a good thing. For your first year, it's great. Super. With lobster season over, we're in mourning. We got nice boats and all, but we can't go out much. The end of the lobster fishing season signals the close of most fishing activity in the Magdalen Islands. The next generation of fishermen are ready. But for the moment, the fish stocks don't offer a bright future for its young people in the commercial ground fish fishery. It's hard to keep people fishing. They need to be able to fish for more than nine or 10 weeks relying on unemployment. They need to be able to hope to live off it for four or five months a year. The future is promising, as I said. Very. I believe that absolutely, especially for ground fish. Cod is in our blood. We were born into it, and I know it'll come back and be a main fishing stock again. We won't make the same mistake again, believe me. We want to build up the stock. For now, we're keeping the commercial fishing limit as low as 1,500 tons, because we all want the stock to recover. In the short term, for cod in the south of the Gulf, there's not much hope. Today, when you look at the amount of fish in the water, there's not a huge quantity. But I believe there's enough to feed people in the region and enough to maintain the level of skill. And that's important. We've learned a great deal. We've made mistakes, sure, because we kept doing things the old way. But I feel that we can now show there's a better way, which we will pass down to the next generation. I think that's the true value of this way of life. Experienced fishermen are concerned. Expertise in the ground fish fishery is likely to be lost if the next generation can only work in lobster fishing. This is your second season? Yeah, my second season as captain. I bought my boat when I was 20. First year I fished, I was 20, and this is my second year, and I'm 21. There are a lot of young people coming up, more and more, I'd say. If you look at this coming year, there's probably 10 people enrolled in the two or three year courses for a fishing diploma. So it's great to see that there's still young people in the Maggies who want to stay here and fish. I love it. I have no trouble getting up in the morning because I love getting up to go to work. For me, it's not work. It's a pleasure. And for sure, it takes concentration to try to find as much lobster as you can, but... No, when I'm out at sea, I look back at the shore, I'm a happy guy. The new generation is here, but it will need to draw lessons from the past to develop a new, responsible and sustainable fishery. History has taught us to be wary of a fleeting success. Today, a new way of thinking is gradually taking shape and is dictating new rules of prevention that did not exist before. If fishing was at the heart of the settlers of this country, the exodus of young people to major cities is now a threat to the future of the communities that still depend on the St. Lawrence for their survival. The St. Lawrence, which the new generation of fishermen continue to call the sea. After the storm, the soothing promise of protection and conservation for tomorrow seem to lift the heavy mists of the past. They are words of hope that echo across the sea, never to be forgotten. <laughs>